I think I had a, an allergic reaction to something I ate. That's what I, my, my theory. But um, it's the nature of uh, having a human body. <laughs> and um, maybe it feeds in a little bit to this topic this morning on um, right effort. So yesterday I talked about right view and right intention, the wisdom component, and then in the afternoon about right speech, right action, and oh, I didn't talk about right livelihood yet. We'll start there. And um, so we can finish off the, the, the part on um, sila or virtue. Fundamentally, the teachings on right livelihood are about not doing harm through our work, a way of work that harms no being. It's a little tricky to figure out what that is these days. Obviously, some things um, are really apparent um, after this uh, shooting in uh, California last week. I saw a little um, statement by the man who sold the gun in Nevada. And he said that this was so against any, everything he believes in. And I just thought, you are so confused. <laughs> um, the Buddha said, don't trade in weapons, don't um, don't trade in alcohol or drugs or um, don't um, take up the job of being a butcher. So you can kind of see it's like anything that would um, cause someone to break the five precepts or that involves breaking the five precepts ourselves and um, sometimes when we're working somewhere we can um, you know it can be a perfectly fine line of work but the the management may want us to do something that isn't so fine um, something deceitful or harmful to to someone and it can be very difficult to say no but i really feel like when we understand the the power i guess i would say of the karma of what happens as we uh, develop the mind and keep keep the precepts and stay far away from harming um, and the power on the other side of what happens when we you know give in and um, do things that are actually harmful once we understand that we we are not so um, in doubt about what to do. Um, once before I um, I had this come up in my own life once before I, I long before I became Buddhist or knew about Buddhism, but I was working at a high tech company and you know, there wasn't anything wrong with our product. The first job I had was for the defense industry. That was a problem. And I really didn't, um, in those very early days, I really didn't think about it when I interviewed for the job or took the job. I was, you know, it was my first actual um, 
professional job and I was happy to get it and it took about eight months before I realized that I just couldn't work there. But then a, a, a few years later, I was working at a company that did um, health insurance software, and you know, it's not an ethical problem for me. <laughs> um, um, but the management wanted, I would hear from people when I started working there that the management would ask them to lie to customers or to do things that they felt were was re were really wrong and um, it sounded pretty horrible but um, I didn't you know know what to say or you know what to quite what to think um, about it but then the man the vice president of marketing asked me to um, said that I was going to be sent to um, the East Coast to visit this customer and that I would should tell them things that would cause one of the people in their in their organization to get fired and it really bothered me so I I kept thinking about it as I you know kind of the time of the trip uh, came and I realized I just couldn't do it even if they would fire me so I as soon as I made that decision, I felt better. Um, and I, I went to the vice president of marketing and I asked him, I told him about my decision and I said, it's just, I, I can't do this. This is, um, this is wrong. And it was interesting because he actually, we actually had a long conversation about business and ethics and um, they didn't fire me and we actually became friends and I I don't really think they I don't know of another case where they were asking people to do that stuff and I'm not you know it's like I had no idea what would happen and it was scary um, but I think it's really something as I look back I I feel like I wouldn't have had so much consternation over it if I really understood the power of the precepts and the power of um, virtuous action and the deadly power of um, breaking those precepts. So in the moment it can seem really serious what, what we're facing and we f it feel like we have to buckle but I really would encourage you to um, hold the precepts and the the virtue of your life and the purity of your mind higher than whatever forces there might be in the world so another aspect of livelihood is just how much um, how much of what we do for work um, pulls us away from what's important you know it may not be possible to um, you know have the perfect job I don't know if there is such a thing I like my job quite a bit but uh, there are a lot of things involved in it, you know, that, it, it, as with anything, you're never going to like all of it. And it, and, none of, and it, all of it is not going to be, like, supportive and, and wonderful for your state of mind and all that. But to really, if you have choices, to really look at, well, what, what would support me in developing? Um, because everything that we do is a practice. You know, I'd say what we're, what we're spending our time on is a practice. We're training the mind if we're, you know, like um, on Facebook or, you know, like we're training the mind if we're, um, you know, doing whatever we're doing. 
and like what kind of training is the mind getting and so thinking about you no know, how do I want to make a living that's actually going to be an uplift to my mind is that is that something that is possible and it can have more to do with who you work with sometimes than what the work is and it can have a lot to do with how one is able to address the situations that come up if we can um, be um, mindful, present, um, skillful in communication. And from my experience, I'm sure this is maybe common knowledge that who you work for, your direct manager or boss, makes a huge difference. It's hard to find a good one, but if you do, that's almost better than um, like maybe earning more money. Sometimes you, people might think that you can't really um, take these things on totally as lay people. But I don't think that's true. There's a lot we can do in lay life. You don't have to have robes <laughs> um, to, um, to really live and work and I would say enjoy your life that is completely consistent with the Dhamma and really supportive of our, our development. So now I'm going to talk about uh, right effort, which is of course related because right effort kind of figures into everything. Um, effort or energy is one of the factors that you find on almost all these lists of the Buddhas more than anything else the energy or effort is there because you can't really get much done without effort and it can be challenging to know like when is the right time to um, push harder and when is the right time to ease off and that's not really probably the only dimension to right effort how much we're putting in but the way in which we're we're um, applying our energy is also something to reflect on and I think that for a lot of people in our culture we're very driven and we're um, encouraged to be very driven and uh, it's often too much so when we meditate we might want to like just really like push and it doesn't help that is probably more productive to have consistent um, calm effort you know like you're meditating and you want to have the consistency of of keeping the mind focused and bright and clear on its meditation object and that that's enough if we're striving too hard the word striving is shows up a lot in the suttas and it's uh, it can lead us to think that we need to be really like constantly boot camp kind of attitude and often that's uh, somewhat counterproductive so applying our effort consistently and strong enough to really guide the mind to stay present or um, 
you know, really encouraging ourselves in, um, in reflection on these things we've been talking about, but not with a kind of harshness. Just enough. And of course, the other side, the lax side, this is what I've been told by friends in Thailand, for example, um, that the people appreciate more of this like strive, work, because their tendency is more lay back and um, they need that encouragement from what I'm told. So we have to take into account what our mind is like. If it has a tendency to be lazy, then we need to encourage it more. If it has a tendency to be um, really, you know, intense and and um, pushing hard, we have to like calm it down and um, you know encourage it to be more um, even. So right effort, as I'll drift into mindfulness here, right effort is really an uh, important part of mindfulness, is our mindfulness is keeping something in mind. So we hear tons about mindfulness all over the place, uh, hundreds of books now <laughs> written about mindfulness. And the Buddha, what the Buddha taught as you probably know, was to bring your mind to an object, um, to be present with that, um, to uh, mindfulness also has the word sati is also related to memory. So you're, you're remembering to keep your mind focused on this object. This is what you do in meditation. Mindfulness throughout the day, you're actually observing what's going on. You're observing what you're feeling. You're observing what is happening with others. It's one of the hard things to do, like especially if you're receiving criticism or somebody's upset. If the mindfulness is engaged, then you can observe all the feelings that are coming up for you and you can be listening to what's happening with them, deeply listening to where they're coming from. And as I said earlier, too, mindfulness um, is really powerful with regard to being present with what we're experiencing, um, not being a wash in our feelings, but being able to be present with them instead of in them. It's um, necessary to have mindfulness in order to even know if we're doing something wholesome or unwholesome. It's really valuable because it's that awareness. And the other really valuable part is that when we're, when we're grounded in mindfulness, when that's engaged, then we're coming from a place of calm. And we're coming from a place of stability. So it sounds funny, but the, um, the body can be filled with all kinds of feeling like anger or um, you know, my friend, the grump, grumpy, you know, and, um, and at the same time, we're mindful and present with that. And the, the mindfulness isn't angry. It's not having that experience and that part of the mind that's engaged with this is, has equanimity, it's calm. I remember Ajahn Sumedho talking about uh, one time I, one of the nuns came to him and said, everything's dark. I mean, it sounds like she was dealing with depression and um, maybe some other things, I don't know. but. Um, she said, everything's dark. And he said, is the one who sees that dark, is that part that 
observes that dark. And no matter what we're experiencing, the answer to that is no. There's a way to step back from experience and see it. You're still feeling all this stuff, but you're seeing it. And it's in that space that we have the chance to make decisions about what to do and to recognize that, oh yeah, this is another wave in a process of living, experiencing, that's going to pass. So practice is training the mind to be able to just move into that and, um, and hold that. So when mindfulness is really consistent, this is all the teachers that I see in Thailand, it's like make your mindfulness constant. Like what right now are you being mindful of? And I know it's kind of popular now to talk about kind of a general mindfulness, like I'm just mindfulness of, mindful of everything. It gets um, too floaty and watered down. It's not really very clear. So it's, it's uh, as someone asked um, Ajahn Pasano about this once, and he said, it's a nice idea <laughs> that we can just be mindful and it's not, we're not mindful of something. But the truth is we're mindful of something and then our mindfulness changes to being mindful of something else. It's not like we're just like, it's like this kind of bare awareness idea um, isn't quite really what goes on. So it's, it's important not to fall into some idea that, oh yeah, I'm being mindful, um, when actually maybe not. And so then being present and aware and knowing what we're being mindful of. And it is the case that our mindfulness can expand. So someone said to me, and I've had this kind of thing happen too, that she was like determined she's going to be really mindful. She's driving over to the, to the Dharma meeting and she said, I'm just, I'm going to be really mindful. And then she's being really mindful of, of um, you know, like whatever she was noticing and she misses and she goes through a red light because <laughs> she's like not mindful of that. She's mindful of something else. And it's like, no, this is, it's very, you know, obviously there is um, also this discernment always that comes with mindfulness, the clear comprehension. Um, and, and kindness. So it's those, those three together that really um, cause mindfulness to be correct, right mindfulness. Because you can, you know, mindfully rob a bank. <laughs> You can mindfully do all kinds of things that are wrong, but without clear comprehension and wisdom, you don't, you don't um, have the right context. And for us to be mindful but tight, tense, um, again, striving too much maybe, or um, irritated, you know, it's like we can be mindful of being irritated. All feelings are quite natural. They come up out of whatever old kind of conditioning there, are, there is. But to be mindful and present, um, you know, from that place of calm, from that place of stability. And what we what we tend to do over time is strengthen that part of the mind. It gets, it takes, um, it has more of the space than the part that's reacting to whatever and, and experiencing feeling whatever is happening. I hope that makes some sense. <laughs>
I'm a little bit on a different planet this morning, so forgive me. Um, yeah, I think maybe I'll just, exp- just use that as an example. I, I, um, my digestive system somehow um, had some kind of issue with something, I think, and maybe an allergy reaction. Um, but the whole night of headache, nausea, um, diarrhea, <coughs> and then this morning it's like, okay, I'm going to go to the meditation. And as soon as I start bowing, I'm like, the next thing I'm going to have to do is run to the bathroom and hurl, <laughs> I think. So I don't kind of want to do that. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we've all had these experiences and we probably all we probably all know that we can be with them in different ways you know it's like yes it is possible that something bigger is going wrong my eyelids are also thickened so there's some kind of allergy thing probably going on you know there's this like but it's like how can we bring we just bring the mind to what's happening use enough wisdom to like okay this is the best thing to do to support the body right now um you know not worry about what people are going to think um not worry about whether or not this is some bigger crisis using enough awareness and mindfulness that in case some indication shows that it's something bigger that we do the right thing you know obviously this is like um another opportunity to be present with what's happening and uh, make choices about how we deal with it you know and it's it's um constant you know like right now you can decide where you put your attention and you know maybe it's like wow she's really annoying today or you know <laughs> i don't want to be listening to this i'd rather be outside it's so nice or whatever right and you can also like think yeah i really know all this you know but then maybe there's also a way to be present with that whole mental or emotional experience in a way that we learn something and come to understand ourselves more. Um, Maybe there's a question you'll ask later that will drive this whole discussion more deeply uh, into into something that you really want to know. Anyway, just a thought. So I think what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about samadhi to round out the Noble Eightfold Path. And then this afternoon, take more questions if you're up for that. And um, each one of these noble factors is, you know, a book in itself, of course. There's a lot. There's a lot in the suttas and there's a lot written about them and a a lot um, said about them. And as I said from the beginning, I really want us to put our attention on practice. So samadhi is, samadhi is the part um, that we often think of is the practice, right? Because it's the the sitting, um, bringing our mind to a single focus. And as I said, meditation was kind of the first main thing that people in this culture wanted from Buddhism. But it's, it's essential that all of the factors are there. As I said before, all of, we're working on all eight and samadhi can um, be thought of as the practice of meditation and it also can be thought of as a state that you experience in meditation so when the mind becomes very still 
One of the experiences you can have is noticing that there isn't anything you want and there isn't anything you want to get rid of in that state. That the mind is really at peace. And there are different levels of uh, samadhi. So in the suttas, we see the description of the four jhanas and the four immaterial states. And they have uh, different qualities. The teachers I have pretty much say, don't worry about that. You know, it can easily become something that we're kind of trying to make happen and tick the boxes off. They're more concerned about whether or not we actually can settle the mind. Because in some sense, the process is quite natural if we let go. And if we look at each of those descriptions of deepening samadhi or jhana, it's always letting go of something that brings you to the next one. So when we're sitting, the focus on our object is consistent and in a way soft, if you if you will. Maybe you'll have the right adjective for how the mind is settled on this object. And, and then to see what there is to let go of. You know, am I holding on to some um, you know, pleasant feeling that I'm getting from this? Can I let go of that? Uh, or am I holding on to, or of course there are the hindrances, the five hindrances that get in the way of our being able to calm ourselves, and they're very important to look at. The last time I taught here, I taught about the hindrances and the enlightenment factors, so I'm not going to really go into it today. But it's like, this is, this is where we take care of what needs to be taken care of, in order for the mind to be settled and at peace and to not um, be upset with ourselves for any reason around whatever is arising. Even if you've been practicing meditation for 40 years, you can have, you know, you can sit down and the mind be running all over the place. And usually what one needs to do in that case is to take the meditation position that's most helpful, like maybe walking meditation is more helpful to bring the mind down. And what we're doing before we sit down to meditate has a very um, big impact. So watching the news and then sitting down to meditate for 20 minutes doesn't really work. <laughs> and uh, it's also because of the other factors, you know, if we're if we're uh, keeping good sila, we don't have as much chaos coming up in the mind when we sit to meditate. So it's, it's, uh, it all works together. And then when we're, you know, there present with this experience, whatever it happens to be, things, start, things may happen that might, you know, bring up some excitement. So, okay, we can let go of that. Um, and it's just just that process of continually letting go and that's really the process of the path you know um, letting go of everything that we think we are letting go of everything we think we have and allowing the the mind to become clear and calm. I think that's enough for the moment. And